I, I'm writing a book uh, that will be called, I hope, that's great, if I finish it, um, A Foreign Policy for the, for the Left. Foreign Policy for the Left, and this is a, a chapter or a part of a chapter of, um, of that book. Um, since I'm often uh, critical of uh, the left, um, I hope that it will be of interest, this talk will be of interest to uh, people on the left, but also people in other political uh, positions. He's also on the left. Not just critical of it. So, what world government is mostly a leftist utopia, a dream about a time to come. <clears throat> but in some of its possible versions, it's a nightmare. Imagine a global tyranny, Immanuel Kant's soulless despotism, described in his essay, Eternal Peace. This is undoubtedly one form of world government, perhaps the most likely form. A global state might, or probably would, take shape in the same way as particular states took shape in early modern Europe, first of all, as an absolutist regime. Tyrannical rule anywhere is nightmarish, but the great advantage of the society of sovereign states is that at any given moment, there will be alternatives to tyranny. There'll be other regimes. There'll be countries that can provide refuge for political exiles and countries that are models of or approximations of um, liberal and democratic rule. Books banned in one place can be published in another. The pluralism of today's world order is its great advantage, and it's only very late at night that I think about its radical replacement by a single all-encompassing state. Still, even pluralism requires some kind of, of governing arrangement, some set of relatively stable procedures, decision-making processes, and it's certainly possible to imagine wide awake a better governed world than the one we have. So what might that require? So I'm going to be begin with an unconventional suggestion. It requires first the completion of the process of state building and boundary drawing. It's only people living in securely established states and with recognized borders who talk about transcending the state system. People without states, Kurds, Tibetans, Palestinians, or people living in predatory states, or people living in failed states that cannot defend their citizens against sectarian militias or mercenary adventurers. None of these people are interested in political transcendence or world government. They have a different dream. They want a state of their own, a decent and competent state capable of providing them with the routine benefits of sovereignty physical protection, economic management, welfare, and education. The worst conflicts in the world today, the most extensive human suffering, derive from statelessness and state failure. This seems to me an obvious point, and yet many people on the left are or claim to be hostile to the state, especially to the nation state, which is the most common state formation in the world today. They indict the state for its, the nation state, for its parochialism, for the nationalist um, furies it sometimes unleashes, for its chauvinism. Early on in the history of the left, in the early 20th century, this was a genuinely universalist argument. Rosa Luxemburg, for example, wrote with equal fury against Poles, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Czechs, Yugoslavs, Jews, and 10 new nations of the Caucasus. She described them all as rotting corpses that climb up out of 100-year-old graves and feel a passionate urge to form a state. More recently, however, leftists have been sympathetic 
as we should have been, to national liberation and the formation of new states in India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Algeria, Tunisia, Ghana, Rhodesia, Angola, and many other places. And we are sympathetic right now to Palestinian national liberation. We are mostly enthusiastic when we probably should be wary about populist nationalism in Venezuela, Bolivia, and other Latin American countries. We provided strong and I think justified support for the Greek assertion of national interest against the EU and its German bankers. But all these are, in a curious way, exceptions to the general rule of leftist hostility to the nation state. What is curious here is that the exceptions far outnumber the applications of the general rule. The crucial application is to Jewish statehood in Israel. Across much of the left, opposition to Zionism determines the correct ideological position on the national question. A few other cases seem to fall under the general rule. Widespread indifference on the left to Kurdish national liberation is one example, and a readiness among many leftists to oppose the local nationalists in Georgia and Ukraine and to make apologies for Russian imperialism is another. Of course, leftists are also opposed, as we should be, to nationalism at home and to all the native-born bigots and anti-immigrant politicians. The prevailing view of nationalism abroad, however, seems to be driven by and largely restricted to a kind of ideological fury at the State of Israel followed by the demand that Israel be replaced by a post-national state of all its citizens, identified with none of them, and according to the most recent opinion polls, desired by very few of them. I won't attempt to explain the fury. That's for another lecture. I do want to say, however, that there are men and women on the left with an entirely different position, more like the one I mean to defend here, a state for all the people who need one, including the Jews. Helping people in failed states may require forms of military intervention that violate the principle of state sovereignty. But the long-term goal of these interventions if, for example, there had been an intervention in Rwanda to stop the massacre there or in Darfur, the long-term goal of interventions like that would have to be to establish or strengthen sovereignty. That's what state building means. Even if no one knows how to build states and places where centralized power has collapsed, where warlords rule or rival religious sects massacre each other's members, the project that the intervening forces would have to set for themselves once the killing had been stopped would be to create some form of legitimate local authority. <clears throat> Whatever the difficulties, they would have to aim at an effective state and a government sufficiently popular to govern without excessive coercion. That's a minimum goal, no doubt, and certainly not a transcendent one, but it is practical and necessary. I don't imagine universal peace following from the completion of the state system, but rather local peace, here and here and here, peace in pieces. We can think of this work of completion, the creation of new states and decent states, as a defense of human rights which are radically at risk in the absence of effective government. In the world as we know it, a decent state is the best agency for the protection of human rights. NGOs like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International report on the chronic misbehavior of states and hope for state correction, but they can't themselves protect the people whose rights are being violated. They are working, though they not, may not be willing to admit this, 
they're working for regime change, but the regimes they hope to change are and can only be state regimes. Consider a possible model for this work of completion. John Locke's argument for religious toleration. The men and women who yearn for independence and effective government are like 17th century dissident Protestants who yearn for religious freedom and political protection. Remember Locke's argument. The establishment of this one thing, he wrote in his letter on toleration, would take away all ground of complaints and tumults on account of conscience. The one thing for Locke was religious toleration, a free church for every believer. The one thing today is a free state, a decent and competent state for every subject and citizen. And the grounds of complaint and tumult today are the absence of national independence and physical safety. Take away these grounds, that is, provide all the world's peoples with independence or some functional equivalent and security, and the world would be a better place. That seems, again, an obvious point. Locke goes on, there is only one thing which gathers people into seditious commotions, and that is oppression. Oppression, national oppression has the same gathering effects as religious oppression. But now we have to add that anarchy and lawlessness, the absence of effective government, civil war, or worse, the Hobbes' war of all against all, these can be as oppressive as a persecuting orthodoxy or an imperial tyranny, even if they don't have, haven't had the same gathering effects. Peace will come when conscience is quiet, when national aspirations are accommodated, and when people feel that everyday life is reasonably secure. But the quiet conscience is must, much easier to imagine than the satisfied nation or the secure population. We have some experience of consciences at peace. Liberal states have made Lockean toleration an everyday reality, and the results have been very close to what Locke predicted. Disagreement and conflict persist, but the sorts of tumult that characterized the 17th century have been surpassed, and it would seem decisively surpassed, wherever religious persecution has been given up as state policy. Would a similar result follow if every form of national subjugation and state breakdown were overcome? But this second political transformation cannot be made effective in the same way as the first. Any number of religious groups can be tolerated on the same territory. While each nation needs a territory of its own, I'll qualify that in a moment, if it is to achieve political autonomy or sovereignty within secure borders. Self-determination requires a specific physical space and a monopoly on the use of force within that space. Neither of these are necessary for religious self-government. But the space required, with its borders clearly marked, is not instantly available or naturally or divinely assigned to particular groups of people. It has to be appropriated in one way or another, and the appropriation will often be contested, not only by imperial powers, but by other nations looking for security for their own members. So complaint and tumult don't end. One nation's freedom is often another nation's oppression. All that is true. And it might account for leftist hostility to the nation state if this were, in fact, a consistent hostility. But it isn't. And what's more important, it shouldn't be. For the men and women caught up in national conflicts are not led to forego the hope of statehood and sovereignty. And these are people to whom we should be responsive. <coughs> 
nor are the liberation struggles and the great power interventions and the contention of rival militias and feuding sects necessarily endless and endlessly destructive. There are useful historical examples of vindicated claims to independence and security. The separation of Norway and Sweden, the Czech or of the Czech Republic and Slovakia, the breakup of the Soviet Union, the creation of East Timor and perhaps of Kosovo, the restored unity of Nigeria after its civil war. We can, moreover, imagine the reconstruction of failed states, even if successful cases are hard to find. And independence and security do bring, or would bring, if only locally, something like the peace that the Lockean argument promises. The way to that peace is, I admit, often bloody. And there probably are cases where people from different nations are so radically entangled on the same piece of territory that a good border is inconceivable. And then one hopes for some version of federation or autonomy and a central government strong enough to keep the peace. The goal is a world of states within relatively secure borders from which no sizable group of people is excluded. Is this a utopian program? Well, yes, in the sense that such a world exists nowhere. But no, in the sense that the achievement of statehood and security by one people after another is an actual and visible process. That the process is uneven, that it is sometimes violent, that it produces anomalies along the way, None of these is sufficient reason to back away from it. <clears throat> but I want to add immediately that the completion of the state system is not any kind of historical endpoint. Precisely because of the difficulties along the way, further processes are set in motion which are not similarly constrained by the idea of sovereignty. The first is a process of decentralization within states. This is often a means of securing peace and stability by granting autonomy to some regionally centered ethnic group. But, but I can say this differently. Decentralization is a way to open new room for cultural expression and democratic self-government. A partial devolution of sovereignty can often meet the needs of ethnic or religious minorities that have maintained some territorial integrity. They are not yet a dispersed population, but are no longer so differentiated from the bulk of their fellow citizens as to require or want full independence. Some degree of autonomy is sufficient for their purposes. The examples might be the Welsh, or less probably the Scots or the Basque people. Its autonomy is sufficient, or at least for most of them. The devolution of sovereignty rather than its entire appropriation suffices in these cases for the defense of group identity and physical security, or better, one can plausibly imagine that it would suffice. The second and probably the more important process that follows from the completion of the state system is one of alliance, creating new federations and economic and political unions among sovereign states. The European Union is the obvious example, and there is much to learn from its vicissitudes and also from its triumphs. The most important lessons are first the problematic character of an economic union that is not accompanied by a democratic political union. And second, the difficulties in the construction of this political union that derive from pre-existing national loyalties. Because it features <clears throat> a neoliberal economy without a social democratic government, the EU has failed to do justice to its weakest member states as in the case of Greece in 2015, and it has also failed to do justice to its weakest individual members, 
the large number of men and women left behind by the free movement of capital, commodities, and labor. Justice was once an issue dealt with through domestic politics. Now that politics has been partially taken over by the EU and effectively replaced by administration. But this administration, for all its famous regulations, doesn't govern the neoliberal economy so much as accommodate it. The old nation states survive within the EU. And if they aren't allowed to impose some constraints on the free movement of capital, commodities, and labor, or better, to establish some protection against the adverse effects of free movement, their resentful citizens will produce a nationalist backlash, as in the 2016 British vote to leave. If we want to avoid the backlash, we have to think of organizations like the EU in internationalist rather than cosmopolitan terms. The difference is important. Internationalism assumes the existence of nations and works to create obligations and solidarities across national boundaries. Cosmopolitanism aims to abolish the boundaries, which is almost certainly a step too far. There is another way to express the leftist worry about unions like the EU. The nation state is still the only political space within which the left has been able to win political victories. It is the home. It is the home of social democracy and welfare. Indeed, the nation state and the welfare state go together. And the more homogeneous the nation state is, the stronger its welfare system. Nevertheless, it seems to me that leftists should be actively trying to expand the political space within which we can work effectively. Writing in 1985, the British socialist Michael Rustin described, quote, the attractions of political work in an expanded European dimension. This is, he argued, an opportunity for socialists working across political boundaries to equal the much more powerful links that already exist between corporations and governments. Now, in fact, European socialists haven't been able to do that, nor have they realized the economic promise of those new linkages, that the wider political spaces across which socialists are active would make more resources available for redistribution. That was the original hope of left-wing supporters of the union. It is a hope, I think, that we should not give up. Nor should we forget the great achievement of the EU, the transformation of Europe from a zone of war to a zone of peace. This is an important, even though incomplete, transcendence of both the limits and dangers of sovereignty. It's a transcendence of the limits in that the union makes for a stronger and therefore safer position in the global economy and in international politics. It's a transcendence of the dangers insofar as the government of the Union provides mechanisms for making difficult decisions and dealing with interstate conflicts. Those mechanisms are not, at this moment, either democratic or secure. Nor is it clear what kind of loyalty the EU commands from its multinational citizenry. But Union and Alliance now stand as possible, hopeful moves beyond sovereign statehood. <clears throat> I don't want to forget the failures of the United Arab Republic and the East African Economic Union in the 1970s, and the weakness today of regional associations like the African Union and the Arab League, which suggests that statehood still has the primary claim on most of the world's peoples. And I don't want to deny that the completion of the state system has and will will have significant disintegrative effects, as we saw in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Statehood for Tibet 
and full recognition of the independence of Taiwan, both impossible at this moment, but necessary features of my utopian project, suggest further disintegration. For that very reason, it's important to argue that as soon as the state system is completed and the promise of disintegration is fulfilled, a new process of alliance and unification should begin. But while we're waiting for alliance and unification, there is another internationalist project that leftists and others should pursue, and that is the creation through multilateral treaties of agencies and regulations that advance critically important goals like climate control, nuclear disarmament, and global public health. There's a fairly common left argument that sovereign statehood stands in the way of all such arrangements. Jonathan Shell in The Fate of the Earth argues that it is national sovereignty that brings us face to face with the peril of extinction. And the British leftist Anthony Barnett, at the end of a brilliant polemic against Margaret Thatcher's Falklands War, repeats the warning, quote, so long as the institutions and passions of national sovereignty retain their domination in Britain and el elsewhere, the world will continue to be ruled by those who are likely to ensure its destruction. That's an argument perfectly compatible with the defense of national liberation in countries like Algeria, since it's aimed chiefly at the sovereignty of the great powers. Still, we had better hope that it isn't right. For it is only sovereign states that can enter into self-limiting unions like the EU or sign treaties like the Non-Proliferation Treaty. The path to disarmament and climate control goes through the sovereign state, especially through the most powerful sovereign states, because that's where social movements with global ambitions get started. That's where the internationalist left has to begin its efforts to set limits on sovereignty. Powerful states are most likely to accept the limits necessary for a better world order only if they are pressed by a strong left. But this also has to be an intelligent left whose members understand that sovereign states can indeed make war foolishly and criminally, as in the Falklands or in Iraq, but they can also make peace. No other political agent now standing can do that. In the absence of anything like world government, what kinds of governmental arrangements can there be or should there be among sovereign states? What can we do at the global level? What we already do is not negligible, though I want to argue that it is less than it appears to be and much less than many people pretend it is. We have a global constitution, the UN Charter, a global Bill of Rights, the 1948 Declaration, a global parliament, the General Assembly, a global executive committee, the Security Council, a global judiciary, the World Court and the International Criminal Court, the ICC, a global banking system, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and a global agency to regulate trade, the World Trade Organization. But neither the Constitution nor the Bill of Rights have ever been enforced. Parliamentary decisions are merely advisory. The Executive Committee is usually deadlocked. The courts cannot compete with state legal systems. And in the years of the recent global recession, neither the international banks or the trade organization had any significant role to play. So let's look more carefully at the three most important of these global institutions, the Security Council, the courts, and the IMF, and ask what they are in fact and what they might be. First, the Security Council is the executive arm of the UN, which is at this moment nothing more than a pretense of world government. 
The council is obviously not an effective organization. The veto power of its five permanent members is commonly taken to be the major cause of its inability to act like an executive, but there is another reason less often discussed. All the members of the council think only in terms of their own national interests. There is no overriding sense, there isn't even an underlying sense of being responsible for the way the world goes. The world is not at this moment a political unit for which anybody feels responsible in the way that some political elites in domestic societies feel responsible for the fate of their country. In democratic states, those elites, uh, in principle at least, can be forced to act responsibly or they can be removed from office. Nothing like that is possible in international society or at the UN. Confronted with a human disaster in Rwanda, say, or in Darfur, Council members calculate their parochial interests and take their stands. It matters very little what these stands mean for the people most at risk who have no power and are not regarded as fellow citizens of a global community. Until they are regarded that way, the Security Council will not be an effective agent on their behalf, which is why right now people at risk need a state of their own. Everybody knows this. The Security Council cannot prevent wars or fight wars or end wars. The usual left demand to take this or that issue, the 9-11 attack is my favorite example, the usual left demand to take this or that issue to the UN is really an unacknowledged demand that nothing be done. This is what I call the politics of pretending. And I have to say it works pretty well. The political leaders of states strong enough to intervene in a humanitarian crisis can refuse to intervene and refuse to and escape any responsibility for the disasters that follow. Pretending that the UN can act effectively is a very effective way of closing one's eyes and turning one's back. But it's possible to imagine a council that could act, at least in dire emergencies, to rescue people at risk, perhaps with an armed force of its own. The UN commander in Rwanda in 1994 thought that he could stop the killing if the 5,000 soldiers at his disposal were reinforced. But the Security Council, in part because of US opposition, could not agree to authorize him to act. What is necessary in cases like this isn't a high-tech army on the American model, but something much less, hence also something much less than a global state. A few UN successes in places like Rwanda and Darfur would transform its image. But this would require a sense of responsibility among the great powers that is plainly, radically absent today and it would require some way of giving a political voice to the people at risk. Second, international courts can resolve disputes only when the states involved want them resolved. The 2009 case of the ICC and the president of the Sudan tells us a great deal about the difficulties of global justice today and about its unacknowledged dangers. The court's indictment of President Bashir for crimes against humanity in Darfur may one day be recognized as a landmark in the defense of human rights. In 2009, however, the ICC was acting like the judicial arm of a world government when there was no world government, another example of pretending. Its decisions could not be enforced. And when those decisions put people at risk, the court was unable to protect them. When President Bashir expelled aid organizations, all aid organizations from the Sudan, he was retaliating against Darfurians for the ICC's action against him. He was deliberately provoking a humanitarian crisis, or more accurately, intensifying the crisis that already existed, and there was nothing 
that the court could do or that any international agency could do in the name of the court. I know the value that even a costly precedent might have in future time, but the immediate consequences were ugly. Pretending that a world government exists when no such thing exists seems to me an example of moral and political irresponsibility. Still, again, it's possible to imagine an international court that acted only in concert with a military intervention authorized by the UN in conditions where it could actually secure the persons of indicted criminals and protect other people from any political retaliation that the indictment might bring. The court that dealt with the former Yugoslavia provides, I think, a useful example. I won't pretend that this court is the judicial arm of a fully functioning world government. But successful prosecutions like those in The Hague do move the world towards something like a remedial system of global justice. For what is most immediately necessary is to supplement the justice done in relatively decent and competent states with an internationally authorized form of judicial action for states that have failed or collapsed. Third. Until the radical downturn of 2008, one might have thought that global economic management was more of a success story than global political management. Certainly, there were economists at the IMF and the World Bank who had some sense of being responsible for the well-being of the globe's inhabitants. But this was a sense shaped by a particular ideology, neoliberalism or the Washington consensus, and not by an actual responsiveness to the needs or aspirations of those inhabitants. Critics would say that this ideology reflected the interests of a small group of wealthy nations. But if that's so, these nations seem to have been wrong about their interests. The policies promoted by the IMF stimulated global economic growth for a time. But they also contributed to the subsequent downturn and the resulting instability by producing radical inequalities within many countries and among countries, between the center and the periphery, between urban and rural areas, between the technical elite and workers with lesser skills. We have watched the growing separation of the very well off from the poor and the desperately poor. But stable growth requires that more and more people participate as producers and consumers in the global economy. And that requires, in turn, a more egalitarian global society. In democratic states, there's a remedy for gross inequality. Angry men and women organize social movements, unions, and political parties to challenge the economic hierarchy, regulate the market, and redistribute the wealth. At least, that's the way it used to work. Social democracy reshapes laissez-faire capitalism. But this happens only, in the, or it has happened, only in domestic societies, not yet in international society, not yet in the EU either. Cosmopolitan leftists who imagine that declining sovereignty and open borders will lead to a more egalitarian world are engaged in yet another version of the politics of pretending. Right now, campaigns against inequality take place only in the sovereign state. And it's only there that we see the struggles, the negotiations, the compromises, and the new social arrangements that we need. Domestic political leaders and economic managers act for and in response, at least this is the way it's supposed to work, to organize popular constitu constituencies. But the IMF is not in any sense responsive to an organized popular constituency. Even if its managers feel a responsibility for global well-being, this is not a politically enforced or enforceable responsibility. They do not answer to the people for whom they are responsible. 
and I don't see any ready or easy way to make them answerable. That would require, again, leftist politics in some kind of global space, which is as yet undiscovered. Right now, it is only political work within particular states and probably only wealthy states that can force changes in the politics, the policies of the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO. Elected leaders in the United States, Japan, the EU, and a few other places could pressure the global economic bureaucrats. But they will do this only in response to men and women at home who demand that they do it. The way to a social democratic IMF and to greater global equality, like the way to disarmament and climate control, lies through state politics. We can hope for cooperation across state boundaries in pursuit of greater equality by international trade unions, for example, or by new social movements, just as there has been, always has been, cooperation among corporate elites in shaping the policies that produce the inequality we live with today. But elites function easily in international society, while the space for mass political action has yet to be found. So here then is a provisional program, not for world government, but for better government in the world. Begin by providing all the world's people with a decent and competent state. I know that isn't an easy thing to do, but it is possible incrementally here and here and here. What is most important is that the value of statehood be recognized. There's too much loose talk about transcending the state system when full participation in that system is the greatest need of the poorest and most oppressed people in the world today. But as statehood is achieved and stabilized, it also needs to be complicated by complementary processes of devolution and alliance. The second of these is the more important. Economic and political cooperation across borders can greatly enhance the benefits of sovereignty and it can also provide intimations of transcendence and global government. The early redistribution of resources within the EU, for example, suggests the kind of work that might be done by a social democratic IMF. And similarly, the coordination of military activity by EU states, the formation of a rapid deployment force, for example, if it were ever rapidly and successfully deployed, could provide a model for a future Security Council. Third, we must aim at the construction of international institutions, the Security Council, the ICC, the IMF, and others that can provide some background regulation, act effectively in emergencies, and fill the gaps opened up by state failure or incapacity. I don't think that we should aim for more than that. Just that would be an enormous benefit. People living in relatively decent and competent states don't need a global state or even the modest version of global governance I have just described. But there is something else that they need, that we all need, and that is a global civil society. That's where space might be found, might be found for politics across borders. That's where groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, groups that are born at home, can agitate for human rights abroad. That's where environmental issues can be raised and states can be pressed to respond to dangers that do not respect their boundaries. And that's where unions that call themselves international can become international in fact and express solidarity with unorganized and underpaid workers around the world and that's where a new generation of activists might find a voice. Exactly how politics would work in a developed transnational civil society, we don't know. What kinds of mobilization might be possible? What kinds of debate and deliberation? There are plenty of reasons to be skeptical. This isn't familiar, and it may not be friendly political space. But if we hope for a decent global politics after sovereignty, and right now, we need an active and open civil society 
where people speaking different languages with different political loyalties, recruited from all over, can engage with one another. They will begin at home, but they have to find their way beyond the boundaries of the state. So this is the full program. First, the gradual completion of the state system so as to provide security for citizens. Second, a slow process of political alliance among states so as to create wider and wider zones of peace. Third, the improvement of existing international institutions. And fourth, the creation of a space for the political engagement of individual men and women without regard to their citizenship. Each of these can only be approached e incrementally. I won't pretend that this is a revolutionary <coughs> program, but it is the right program for an internationalist left. Thank you. simple question. Hello, and I'm glad that you're here in, in such fine form. Um, <clears throat> and that is that um, you talked about the importance of all the governments, all the states, doing what they can on behalf of human rights, which portrays the states as in some ways instruments of human rights. But human rights taken as a phrase is highly internationalist or transnationalist or something that defies the state. And many people on the left who accept the idea of human rights, and of course many don't because they don't accept the idea of the human war rights or much of anything else, but they uh, look at people suffering, see their suffering in terms of human rights and not in terms of the state. And that fuels their critique of the state. So the question is, how can you see the state working on behalf of human rights when human rights itself seems to be a critique of the state? Well, I don't think human rights is a, a critique of the state. I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of the available agents to act on behalf of um, the range of, 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 of human rights. And um, the state is the critical agent. The state is, sovereignty is right now the, the, critically, the critical form of collective agency. And um, if, if, you, if you imagine um, the, the grossest violation of human rights, um, a, 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 a regime that is massacring its its own citizens, like um, so Cambodia in the 70s, uh, the Khmer Rouge regime. Um, there is no international agency that can step in and stop that. It was stopped by the Vietnamese, by a state, a neighboring state, which had both strategic reasons, but also, I assume, moral reasons, to stop the killing. Um, now I'm 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 eager to um, to imagine, as I suggested, um, a Security Council with a force of its own that could intervene in a place like Rwanda, um, uh, and, and that would be an um, an agent, um, a global agent that would in uh, that would invade the sovereignty of states within which human rights were massively violated. Um, we need, we, we, it would be a good thing to have an international agency of that sort with, with an army of its own, with a, at least a, a force uh, specifically trained for interventions of that kind. Um, but, but the full range of human rights there is no, there is no, you can't imagine the Security Council intervening um, for the sake of, um, for the sake of 
nine tenths of the rights listed in the 1948 Declaration of Rights. The only, the only agent that can enforce those rights is the, the state. Clarification: What about the, uh, the EU with its human rights clause? Well, the, the EU is a is a is a is a state in formation, um, and uh, the, the 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 problem of the EU right now is that, that it doesn't have an executive arm. Um, human rights decisions are in fact. Their I was just yeah. to disprove your claim only. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, so, uh, one of the points that you made towards the end is that uh, people living in well functioning states don't need more government. Um, and I think that's really interesting and it suggests a possible alternative uh, trajectory for the incremental changes uh, that you're talking about for uh, world, our, our existing global uh, state. Um, so instead of thinking about it as trying to create a full-fledged state at the global level, um, what if uh, the task of the global government was, as it were, to be the state fallback for failed states? That is to say, you have your fast response unit, which is the uh, state security apparatus that's failed in that state. You have your world courts, which move into those spaces in order to take care of the gross human rights violations which pop up in failed state situations. You have um, the aim of uh, bodies like the IMF and the, the World Bank are development, redevelopment, uh, getting a, a banking system or whatever that a, a failed state needs to get back on its feet. You could imagine uh, the world government being as a kind of fallback option for, for states in this way. What do you think about that? Yeah, I thought that was what I was um, advocating. <laughs> Um, I, I'm in favor of, um, of moments of world government. I, I recently gave a lecture in Nuremberg on the 70th anniversary of the first verdict at the Nuremberg trials, and I described Nuremberg as a moment of world government. And, and um, it, it was described by one of the prosecutors, called it um, an episode. And, and thought of terms of recurring episodes. Uh, now, the um, chief prosecutor for the International Criminal Court was in the audience, and she did not like that idea. She has a, 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 a more <clears throat> systemic conception of what, um, of what a judicial system should be like, and presumably she would, she would want an executive arm so that the ICC doesn't get into situations like the one in the Sudan, or even the worst case in Kenya. Um, Other questions? Yeah. So this was, um, uh, at one point you mentioned the ease with which corporate elites managed to work across global, you know, state boundaries. What? Um, uh, which global elites, like yes. corporations yes. and so forth, managed to work across state boundaries. And I'm just wondering whether given the big leverage that corporations have with respect to states, right, because they can always take their business elsewhere, wouldn't the right response be to organize at a global level? Because, say, unions, which used to be how one organized for better worker rights, better working conditions, have less power against a global corporation than might potentially take their business elsewhere. Um, so it would seem like that's an argument for having at least some sort of organized labor at a global level rather than at a state level. Yes, yes, no, I, but, but it is, I, this is the response I should have made to Carol a minute ago. Um, the, the EU is created by a series of state decisions to submit to the, 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 the human rights regime of the EU. And, only the states can do that. And so if there is to be a, um, a, a social democratic IMF, uh, you would indeed need the agreement of the, the great powers. There's, and, and the agreement of the great powers will only come if there is a, um, if there is a left 
in, in locally and across borders. Um, yeah, I guess I was thinking about unions as an example of non-state, or at least not directly a state. A, 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 unions as a labor organizing principle that is pushing back against corporations and so on. Yes. But yes. not necessarily always sanctioned by the state because the state often is under a lot of pressure from corporations to... Right, right. But what, what are the unions... Think about the domestic example. Um, sure, the, the, the welfare state, such as it is, and, and ours is fairly shoddy, but the welfare state, such as it is, is the creation of mass mobilizations and political struggles, but those struggles were aimed at forcing the state to act in certain ways. And I don't see at this point how an, um, a, a global movement, imagine um, Occupy Wall Street, which which was, um, which w had an international element, right? There were there were similar things going on in a number of European countries, in Israel, and um, uh, many cities across the United States. Uh, and one imagine that these movements had not been as short lived as they were. Imagine that they had began to um, they had they had begun to to make contact with each other and to organize collective actions, simultaneous general strikes or something, um, what would they be demanding when they did that? They would be demanding that, that their states push for a different regime, global economic regime, because only the states can do that. Uh, Eli. Um, Eli Craig, you I'm just you you better down. stand up and thank you for a great talk. And I'm just, I was hoping you could elaborate on something you said about uh, how homogeneous states uh, are, are, are more effective. Um, can you just speak to why a kind of world of homogeneous states would be more peaceful than the world of energy? No, I didn't. I, what I said was, and there is, this is one of the, um, you know, political science does not have a, a, a very large number of, um, of, of, of results. Uh, but one result of, um, of comparative research is that the strongest welfare systems exist in the most homogeneous states, like the Scandinavian. Um, and that's because, well, it's, you, you, and, and the shoddiest welfare systems, like ours, exist in the most diverse and multi-ethnic and multi-religious states because, the, uh, this is the claim, because in a, in a state like Norway, Norwegians feel a greater obligation to each other than Americans feel to each other, as you may have noticed uh, in the current uh, campaign. Um, so I don't, I, 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 I don't, um, I, I don't think that the nation state is the only possible or legitimate political formation. Um, I also don't think, as many of my friends on the left do, that the American model should be the model for everyone in the world. It, it's quite amazing. The left is brutally critical of almost everything the American government does, but it insists that every country in the world should be like America. Um, like America as an immigrant society, like America as um, a nation of all its citizens like them. America is a, is, is a nation of nationalities. And um, it, there is a, one great moment in American history which determined, I think, it hasn't been written about enough. There is the moment when the Anglo-American settlers, the Anglo-American settlers, who thought they were creating a nation of their own, allowed themselves, with a lot of ugly resistance, but still allowed themselves 
become a minority in what they thought was their country. And that happened in the course of the 19th century. And it's, it has never happened in any other. You can't imagine the French allowing themselves to become a minority in France, or the Danes allowing themselves to become a minority in, 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 in Denmark. Um, um, very briefly, yeah. I mean, the language of political theory, we're, we're trying to get to a, a Kantian end point, or kind of toward Kantian peace, but through kind of Hobbesian means, kind of a Hobbesian rationale for, for the state and its internal peace. It seems to me there needs to be a way to, and this is a, a new idea, to kind of tame the Hobbesian competition across states. So what, what way is there aside from How to tame that kind of uh, cohesion, uh, internal homogeneity that would seem to be fueled. It does it, well, why does it fuel competition? Are the Danes a threat to the world? The, the, that's a homogeneous nation state. And not terribly welcoming at this moment to um, immigrants, but is it a threat to the world? Is Norway a threat? To, Norway is a. Is a Norway seceded from the Swedish Empire in 1903 or 05 um, because it was afraid, the Norwegians were afraid that they were losing their Norwegianness, their language, their history, their sense of themselves. Norway is, um, Norway is uh, the, the Norwegian state is a little engine for the reproduction of Norwegianness. <laughs> and that's not, does, does that bother anybody in the world? Is that a threat to anybody in the world? If there were a lot of states like Norway, wouldn't the world be more peaceful? You have a lot of uh, questions. Let's go over one side to the other. Alex? So, um, when you talk about completing the state project, this seems pretty great when the places have their own territory. But thinking about on a global climate change, there are places that now have states, some not such great states, but at least they have them. But supposing that sea levels rise such that places like the Maldives lose their territory, they just literally don't have it. But those people politically make it known to the rest of the world that they want to stay together as a sovereign community. In what you've described, is there any chance of that? Or are they just going to have to be dispersed as, as refugees? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. I, um, I can, I, there are no empty spaces. The, um, many of the 17th, 18th century political theorists thought that there were vast empty spaces where you could create new states. and. Um, we don't have any empty spaces, so um, I suspect refugee populations, if, if there are victims of ecological disasters, these populations will be dispersed, and we have to hope that they will be treated decently where they are taken. Yeah, I want to follow up on that, because that's kind of one of my questions, too. I mean, in a certain sense, your vision is dystopian. Right? Right. In a certain sense, your vision seems to me dystopian and that you want us first to have all of these states established everywhere. And then we'll deal with uh, the possible multilateral um, institutions. But climate change is a, a very urgent problem and there will be huge numbers of climate refugees. I don't see how the system that you have proposed can deal with that if we defer uh, the, the uh, to my mind, very important uh, transnational institutions and agreements that could possibly be arrived at. Well, well I, mean, I, I, I do agree that it's, that it's fairly urgent to arrive at those agreements, but who's going to agree? Who are the agents of agreement? It has to be the existing states. And they will, that's why Climate change should be a major issue in the American election right now because it's, it, there have to be local political movements demanding that states like the United States engage seriously in, in sovereignty-limiting 
self-limiting agreements for the sake of, um, of the global environment. Also, just one last point, I don't want to interrupt the questioners, but uh, doesn't that challenge a little bit your attitude toward borders? I mean, will you at least consider, given your views on that that you've written on, wouldn't you at least have to uh, open the category of refugees to climate refugees? Yeah, we're, um, re refugees are already a, a major problem in the, in the world. At least you're willing to admit that. <laughs> I just wanted actually to follow up or to, to drill down your question. On the one hand, you very accurately say that the current international system is one of pretending. But then your project of completing the same system, the state system, is there not also an element of pretending in their wishing? Can it be willed into reality? Or is it not much more realistic that the current terribly shaped international system will erode even further? On the one hand, in Africa, for example, the states will not be completed. They'll be failing all around because of climate change, population growth. And those migrants are coming across the Mediterranean, they will lead to a backlash in Europe even more. So the states will not be completed, but the walls come up and we will go into a system where the left, and I would simply ask you to tell us a little bit about how you assess the, real, the realism, not the desirability, but the practicability of your prognosis or of your prescription to complete the state system, not so much in Europe or North America, but actually in Africa, where they're all collapsing. Yes. Um, I'm not... Uh, I, I, I'm not at this moment um, greatly optimistic about um, the international left. Uh, we are at, we are very weak, in, um, uh, just about everywhere, and um, I, I'm not. I, I don't want to pretend that 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 that, 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 that isn't. So, um, I, I don't know what um, the role of, uh, of left intellectuals is in a, given that weakness. Um, it seems to me that one of the things we should be doing is, a, is trying to, even if we are weak, we should be right. <laughs> we should try to create a left that had that, that avoids the, the the errors of the past, um, and that that um, has a a, a a political program that is that that it that addresses what needs to be addressed now. Um, I I don't. Um, we, you, we, we can't succeed unless we, we first get things right. And uh, that's, what, that's, what I, that's what I would like to try to, try to do. Um, the scenario you describe, um, there's, would require a, um, action across state boundaries. The, the recent effort of the EU to um, allot um, quotas to different countries, that they, they should take so many, to divide the burden. Um, that's an example of the right kind of collective action, but it's a complete failure, yes, um, because the, um, the this is a, a state in formation that isn't yet formed. Um, but uh, uh, again, that that action. Think of think of the uh, of the political battles that then follow. So the 
the EU creates a quota and the Poles are told to take so many people. Well, the Polish government says no. There is a, a left in Poland. There is a, 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 a social democratic left. There is even a magazine very close to dissent um, with more of the higher circulation in Poland than we have in the United States. Um, and those people are demanding that the government admit even more than its quota. Now, that's what you have to do, and that's where the, that is in fact where the battle has to be fought, given the world we live in. And leftists have to learn to cooperate. And, um, you know, uh, when, when Jeremy Corbyn advocates, as he did years ago, withdrawing from NATO without consulting our comrades in Poland, um, that's an example of of the failure of, of the left acting across the borders. If, if there is a left in Poland that we want to fight for the admission of refugees, we need to be in touch with them on a range of other issues, and we need to support their work. But, but that's where the battle is going to be fought. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yes, thanks for your talk. I'm clearly responsible states for the answer to many of John's human rights issues and climate change and everything else. Uh, but I was really puzzled by the politics of pretending, because I think you're setting up a rather large straw man and saying that the Security Council or the ICJ or the IMF are people pretending that those are elements of a world government. And I think that first sentence of any textbook on the UN that said, the last thing this is, is a world government. <laughs> and one of the things that I, I think you have to be careful about there is that the third pillar of your program, which I think, you know, the construction of intergovernmental organizations are strengthening, seems to me these days that's an afterthought, if a thought at all. And that what's happened over the last 70 years is a smaller and smaller vision of what global institutions can contribute to this project, not to replace nation states, but somehow to pull them together. Um, I, first of all, um, my first um, use of the phrase, the politics of pretending, was um, after 9-11, when a lot of people on the left opposed any military response and favored um, a judicial war going to the UN. Um, and I thought that was um, that was the dial 911 response to 911, and people were pretending that there was someone who was going to pick up the phone, and they everybody knew that there wasn't. So that's that was the first example in my. Now um, I, I think the ICC when it indicted um, Bashir was acting as if there was um, some kind of executive arm that could, um, that could deal with the consequences of their decision. If they weren't, if, if they didn't have that pretense in mind, then it was surely irresponsible for them to do what they, what, what, what they did. And, and again in Kenya, um, a very similar, very similar thing. Um, so maybe it's an exaggeration, but uh, I, I think there is there is a lot of pretending that things are that, that there is um, an international community that we can call on to act when we know that if we that is it doesn't have to be the U.S. but if, if if some state doesn't step in, nobody is going to step in. What about South Africa and the ending of the pipeline in South Africa? Was that an episode or a moment where global civil society was acting in the way that you envisioned? I think, I think um, yes, I'm not sure of the relative importance of what we did from the outside. Um, the, the, the boycott, and what they did from the inside. Um, 
not sure of the relative importance of those, but, but yes, that was a moment of, um, of uh, global, well, it was a moment when the international left acted well, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know if you remember, there was, uh, this was an economic boycott, there was an argument about um, an academic boycott, and we said no. <coughs> at that time, which is a, a, it should have been a precedent, I think, for future <coughs> discussions. But yes, that was an example, and it, it's also an example of a, of a state that is not a, a nation state. It is some kind of multi, multi ethnic um, construction, and we hope very much that it works. <coughs> I've been told by some white emigrants from South Africa that the number of whites leaving is larger than the government admits, and that could be a threat to its to its standing as a, a multi-ethnic uh, state. But I hope I hope it works. As I said, there isn't. I don't believe there should be one kind of state in the world. I think there can be different kinds federations, states with autonomous regions, um, states which are homogeneous, and states which are radically non-homogeneous. Um, but the most radical visions of non-homogeneity, the, the Austro-Marxists, um, you know, the, there was this group of Austrian Marxists in the um, pre-World War I, period, who, who wanted to, um, to transform the Austro-Hungarian Empire into a democratic state with cultural autonomy for all the national groups within the state. Cultural autonomy means the state budget would assign funds to um, democratically elected groups, um, the Hungarians, the Slavic, the Slovaks, the all of the all of the groups in the empire, and um, and it was a wonderful vision of, um, but nobody wanted it except the Austro-Marxist intellectuals. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a few more questions. Professor Walsh, I anticipate that even the best political theorists speaking on this big topic will pay some difficult person. I think you handled them all right. <laughs> Global talk, just to be. So even theorists have some role to talk about. And I want to talk about small talk. On the way to Great Center, I passed by, I think, four Donald Trump's hotels. And I was thinking about this topic and the hotel. And I said, well, I'm a villager in a small Korean village. On, from one well, whole villages drank. Whole villages? Whole drank. villages, all members of the village. Drank from one well. Drew water from one well. May I say, to make my discourse very simple, we cannot win all of these people by engaging routine, scholastic, you know, logical discourse. We do it, but there should be different kind of language. From that, I see Professor Kornbaum, and I want to just use him as my Philippines. He and I bring from the same water pipe at the graduate center in the whole being used. So, in his body, there is a blood. In my body, there is a blood made from same water. Let's use this kind of language. Do you agree with me? No, sure. No, yes. <laughs> yes. Why? We don't know why you went. Cannot go by graduate center. Yes, in trouble. Let's talk about separate things. 
And by the way, at the Metro Diner where I eat, I speak to them, and they all like it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. By the way, the U.S. South system in the federal post-1945 was explicitly Austro-Marxist. And I think it was because Lenin was also Austro-Marxist, but in the Yugoslav case it was direct. It was the Soviets and Croats in the 19-teens and 20s that were following on that. So I mean, you're wrong that nobody followed it. But the end point helps. I have a question about, I mean, there are clearly global issues from which we would all benefit if there were more than the lines, if there was a real global government, that don't require military enforcement. But where it might, like your case in the FCC, we know that the only reason there is no standing military capacity in the United Nations is because of the U.S. won't allow it. It was envisioned in the Charter, and the U.S. was against it, and it continues to be against it. And when I think about the number of countries in the world that would be delighted to have that capacity, I'm sure it's more than 50 percent. Tom can correct me. But so what I'm wondering is, aren't if you think about that, or if you think about the IMF and the way I also critical, most of the problem is not whether we have states, but what the policies of the United States are. And that would be, to me, if one could change the policies of the U.S., we get where you want us to be much faster. Well, I, that's another example of, um, of where the struggle has to go on. I, I suspect that um, the Russians and the Chinese would also not be happy with the Security Council army um, it, unless they had the veto power. And um, yeah, the, the American role in vetoing any intervention in Rwanda was we were the major Force stopping that. Let me jump in if I could with uh, a question. I want to again pursue uh, the one over there, Jennifer. I think um, the uh, fact that uh, you know that uh, global capital can go anywhere and escapes any um, constraints uh, by your social democracy, democratic states. So are you? There's two things with that, and in addition, there, I mean, the left should really be committed uh, to some notion of equality. It isn't just within a nation state, but it is a more cosmopolitan notion of equality, um, a more international one. I'm just concerned as to how you think that this idea of just establishing states, which um, is going to um, accomplish the goal of equality as well as dealing with economic globalization in a way that benefits everyone, uh, even in the states. I mean, it just seems, aren't you tacitly saying that at least these various states that are going to be set up where they don't exist should be social democratic? Or is that not required? You're assuming they're going to be protectors of welfare. So first of all, aren't they required at least to be social democratic states on your view, and how are they going to succeed? The second aspect of it is how are they going to succeed in countering, um, you know, the uh, negative and oppressive and exploitative effects of global capital um, if they are simply, um, you know, without some kinds of uh, transnational um, controls on it? Well, I'll, I'll... I'm not sure what kind of transnational controls you're imagining, but any transnational controls would have to be the product of state agreements. And so the battle for those controls has to take place in states like, like this one. Um, I, 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 I do think that um, the first this is not a particularly leftist view. The first requirement of, of a state is that it be effective, that it be um, competent. Uh, and I, I think the opponents of the state system tend to radically underestimate the, the value of, of sovereignty. Um, 
the, the um, Asian recession some years ago um, had practically no effect in uh, Singapore. Uh, not because um, not because the Singaporean economy was immune from the consequences, but because Singapore had a smart government. And um, there, is a, there is a book uh, published some years ago called Social Democracy on the Periphery, which is a study of social democratic regimes in places like Kerala in India, um, and then three or four scattered places around the, the edges of um, what we think of as the developed world. And it, this, is, this book is an argument that smart, governments can radically improve the, character, the, the lives of their citizens even within a global economy where they are supposedly powerless. Um, so thanks for the talk. I thought it was really interesting. I want to ask you, you... Stand up. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so what I wanted to ask is if, if this happens, so say the left gathers across the world and advocates for this change, and you actually get the major powers on board and you get the, the states of the world to start giving up these pieces of sovereignty the way that you see them doing it. I, I was wondering if you think that the, the things you described today are a natural stopping point. Like, why wouldn't we want to go a little bit further towards some sort of like, you know, uh, people suggest like a global people's assembly, right? Where you have direct democratic election of some people who do some international governance at the global level. Um, and you might devolve, you know, control over climate change to some sort of global version of an environmental protection agency. And I wonder, would you be able to get what you want? I mean, we, might you end up in a world where there are states and it looks kind of like this solution where cultural sovereignty might be retained at what's presently the state level and, and really not a lot else. Um, and would you be happy with that? I mean, if the left can get it done, is that what we should be going for after we achieve what you said today? So that's, um, that's an alternative to, the, to, what this, what, to what you were defending. Um, I, I don't know how far I would want um, to go in, in the direction you're describing. I value the pluralism of the system. As I said, I want to be sure that if books are banned here, they can be published there. And um, um, a global democratic assembly might be um, protective of um, minorities around the world, but it also might not be. Uh, so you would want a global democratic assembly with a bill of rights and a global court to enforce the bill of rights and um, yes and then a global executive to do what the court tells it or the assembly tells it to do and you would want to be sure that the executive power doesn't creep up and up and up um, the way it does um, we've seen it we are seeing it here, um, and and that's a very risky proposition because you'd be looking at one one um, political process, which if it went wrong, would be a disaster for everybody in the world, instead of a local disaster. How about regional? How about this regional? Yeah, I, 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 I would not leave the EU. I would defend the EU. Greater North America. Okay, I'm afraid that we'll have to bring this to a close. Please join me in thanking.